What's up, Print Hustles? Welcome back to another episode of Printavo Print Hustles Podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printavo. We've got Mr. Stephen Farrag and a really awesome special guest, Jeffrey Paul. He's working for a large company uh, called Young One, who's based out in Korea. But he spends a lot of time in Bangladesh running all of their printing. Huge, I mean, hundred plus machines. You know, does a, a massive amount. You'll maybe hear some some brand name drops in this episode, but uh, really cool episode. But first, we've got awesome sponsors. As usual, you guys know the drill. First up, Multicraft. Have you heard of Multicraft underscore Daddy on Instagram? If you need ink supplies or a Daddy, Multicraft screen printing and digital supplies for over fifty years are providing you with top brands at competitive pricing. Hey, and make sure to mention Printavo to receive an extra 10% off your first order. Now, Supercolor. Supercolor was created with the mission to make high quality heat transfers so fast and easy. Anyone with a heat press can become a printer. And not just getting started as printing, a lot of big shops, as we just talked about, are using heat transfers, including a uh, young one in this episode. So that's really cool. Use Printavo as your code to get 10% off. Uh, your first order, which is awesome too. Thank you to the Supercolor gang. Easy way. You shouldn't spend all day cleaning dirty screens. Easy Way's line of environmentally conscious chemicals will get the job done faster and more efficiently and will cost you a fraction of the cost per screen. Thank you to Easy Way. They are amazing on the chemical side. Absolutely check them out. Last but not least, GraphX Source. Graphic Source specializes in high quality production ready art. If you're using Printavo or if you're not using Printavo to manage your, your shop um, for your shop management software, that is okay. They will work with either, either solution, but they are amazing at separations, digitizing, even mock-ups, um, and they have order entry solutions as well. They can make a pretty big impact in your business, and we've seen a lot of success uh, with them with shops. So check them out. All right, let's get into the episode. Mr. Jeffrey Paul. How are you, sir? Man in the flesh. Farrag, I'm sure you've seen Jeff all over Facebook, right? Just like answering profound <laughs> uh, or antagonizing questions all the time. Where are you right now? I'm in Seattle. So we're um, just a little north of you, I guess, right? So we have a liaison office here uh, in Seattle. So when I'm not overseas, this is where I hang my hat. And uh, my, my wife and kids are here, so... Just if you hear them in the background, we're we're working on that process, but you know they're they're one and three years old, so. <laughs> Bruce and I are our uh, our kids are still uh, still at four legs and and are furry. <laughs> well, well, you, you both have you both have two babies, I guess. Um, Printavo and I guess Campus Inc. Right? I mean that's. Um, I guess those are our babies as well. Those have been your babies um, for for a long time, and I've 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 been following what you guys have been able to do over the last six months. So um, I guess congratulations are in order um, as well as, you know, oh shit, now the hard work begins. Oh shit, now the hard work begins. I, I tell people all very the time when they, when they call and ask me about exiting or acquisitions or all this, I said, you know, it, it's one thing to be only be responsible to yourself. It's, it's a whole other ball game when you're responsible to some, for somebody else's money. And um, it's just, it's a whole new level of stress, um, which is not bad, it's just, just, just different. So. Congrats to both of you, um, and I look forward to seeing what you guys are able to accomplish the next two to three years. It's uh, it's interesting. You get a lot of congratulations, and then internally you're like, <laughs> um, now, now you have someone to answer to. But having someone to answer to, I was talking to Bruce about this, is actually a little refreshing. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, yeah. You, you know, you're brought into companies, right? Like Night Owl, um, to, to hold like Eric accountable. What's that like? Well, that's a full-time job. You know, um, I, I didn't know what I was getting into when i when I signed up for that, but, um, we all, we've all been following Eric, right? From afar, um, with what he and Val are doing, you know, certainly on the technical water-based side. Um, but at the end of the day, they're just good people, right? You know, I, um, I, I worked, I worked for Ryan Moore at, at, um, you know, Ryan Nett and Rock when we first brought Rock in and, um, you know, I left, I left a job in LA that was a really, really very lucrative job in private equity um, many years ago, right before I moved to Ryanette. And that was an example of an industry where I didn't always feel good about what I had to do going home at the end of the day. And it, 
got to a point where it didn't matter how much money I was making if I just didn't enjoy the I enjoy the people I was working with. It's just what you sometimes what you have to do in that business to be successful. It's just not what I wanted to do. So working with somebody like Ryan when I was there and now working with um of course young ones is my full time job, but you know, I kind of sit as a not really a board of advisor. Um, I'm kind of like maybe a maybe a chairman of Night Out, right? I mean obviously Eric's the owner and at the end of the day he's gonna make the decisions that he wants to make. But I guess to your point, Stephen, you know, ha- having someone either just to to bounce ideas off of, or having someone that's, that that can say, you know, look, we talked about this, we weren't going to do that, right? And then and just kind of not so much holding people accountable, but just reminding them a lot of times of some of the commitments they've already made. Um, being an entrepreneur is tough in any business, um, and. Stephen, I guess you would you would know even more so. Bruce, you're certainly in the industry, but a certain a different segment of it, right? Kind of on the vendor, supplier, software side. But Steve, you know, I mean, being an entrepreneur is tough in any business. It's really tough in the screen printing business. Um, it's just the barriers to entry are so low. Um, you know, we'll do a lot of probably storytelling over the next 45 minutes of this call. Um, you know. I've been doing this since I was 13, so that puts me at about 32 years, right? And so I, I can go back to you know the early 90s, usscreenprinters.net, forums. That's where I learned the business. Scott Fresner's website, internet was brand new. You know that's where I would go on there and, and I would see the old veterans talking on this thing called a forum. Well, now we use Facebook, but you know there's still some forums. I prefer the forum. Um, <laughs> it was a little more yeah, static. It allows you to focus better. It is, you know, if you just want to go see, if you want to go see a section about emulsion, you just go to the emulsion section, right? You, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't get real time banter. Um, no. <laughs> you, you, boy, we had some banter back then. Oh my gosh. The yeah, my board still has a little bit. <laughs> My uh, my business partner actually, when I got into business, he's twice my age, but he put this video notebook of uh, basics of screen printing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like a VHS, and at the bottom of it says Scott Fresno. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah U.S. Screen Printers Resource, U.S. Screen Printers dot net or something. You know, in the seventies and eighties, screen printing was hard. I mean, it was lithographs and static cameras and film, and um, you know, Cirochrome Seps is still around. They're in Dallas. You know, you can go to that website and, you know, they would do se- separations would cost you, you know, $2,000, right, for, for, for separate for sets and film. And then, you know, the, your automatic, your your original gauntlet that you bought from, you know, you bought from M&R if you could afford it, um, or, or a formula was, you know, $125,000, $175,000 in 1988. You know, you would have these, these really high costs. Well, it also created a lot of barriers to entry. And so if you were, if you had if you had the resources and you had the talent to do those kinds of things, you could make a really good business. I mean, we were late eighties, early nineties, we were charging, you know, twelve to eighteen dollars a shirt for you know for, for a black shirt with a you know full color you know print on the front. Was there as much competition then? No, not, not, not in our world. But the but the knowledge to get in was like the secret sauce, right? right? Like that if you if you learn I Marshall, we were at lunch in um, uh, in Atlantic City, and Marshall was telling us about like these classes in Buffalo, New York, that people would go to to get trained. And once you had it, like that was your that was your prize, um, and you didn't share it as much, right? See, it was a secret sauce. Um, you know, in 1991 or two, Macintosh came out. I think it was what was the LC2, I think, and you had um, you had the ability within there through either Paint or whatever their software was called, you had the ability to print to a laser printer. Right, and then they figured out that they could put toner on what we call PET film now, or or, or type of vellum, I guess, and yeah. spread it on there. So that that cut out the lithographs, the, the carving of the stencils, the the taking that carving to a static camera that would then blow it up onto a piece of film that you could then, you know, I learned on a lithograph and I learned on a camera, um, and I remember when this newfangled thing called a computer came out and we could print vellum to a laser printer. What what would take us two days now took us twenty minutes. I mean, it was it it, it, it it was like night and day. It was almost immediate. You were like, holy shit! And so, what that did, it didn't really impact the top of the market very much. You know, the the new Buffalo shirts of the world. You know, the concert tours. What it did is it allowed in the U.S. Our industry is really unique. I mean, I travel all over the world. Um, I spend you know about six months of the year somewhere. Just the American entrepreneurial gusto or however you want to rephrase that it's very unique and so it's not that way in europe 
And so what we have here in the U.S. is every city's got, you know, if you've got, if the city's 100,000 people, you're going to have 10 screen printers. And maybe four of them have at least one or two automatics. And they're printing for the, you know, the, the local church youth group, the high school band, um, mm -hmm. you know, the little leagues, the YMCAs. And they're all out there. And they're, and they're producing a high-quality product. Right. Um, and it's become it's become commoditized, which we've heard that word a lot in our business and a lot of industries. How, how do you think? How do you think in a in a commodity based business, people, in your opinion, stand out? Then it's the same ways that we hear. You know, if you go to ISS and you sit in one of these these, these business classes, which I would encourage people to go to as many trade shows as possible. Um, you're just learning, you're networking, but it is, it is what you hear in those meetings. It's you can set yourself you can set yourself apart with art, right? Absolutely, you know art. You know, if you can, if certainly if you have a skill, if, you, if you're an illustrator or a tracer, or if you can build out, you know, somebody like a um, like a Graphex, but you know, shout out to your sponsor um, who does a, a fabulous job. Um, and so, finding someone who like that that can make really high quality artwork is always going to set you apart. Now, you know, in today's age, you know, fulfillments become a big part of things. Online stores have become a big part of things. Um, you know, when I was when I was in the business, you know, here in the U.S., and I, it, it, and I guess we'll spend a little time in a minute to talk about my history. But you know, that was our bread and butter. Was you know, was Little Leagues. Mm -hmm. Well, Little League was a nightmare. And you'd but, have to go. You'd have oh man, name drops and sponsors name drop, and just just the organization that would go into it. This is before we had uh, internet stores. Well, you know, my my mother, um, um, who who I was in the business with, and my and my stepdad. They, she was the organizer. So we had these triplicate order forms, right? We had we had the white on top, yellow in the middle, pink on the bottom. Fair remembers those. And, and yeah, we used those up picture. until 2015. Well, yeah. I'm I, I, hard pressed to still find a better system in some regards, right? It, it, paper, you know, I, maybe that I'm, you know, kind of an okay boomer comment, but um, there, there's still value there. <laughs> um, and certainly in, on the on the little league side of things, you know, we we had a system that was really organized, and we would custom make these little league order forms. And we would give these triplicates, and then each each team mom, right, the, the uniform manager for that team would take these triplicate order forms, and we made it so simple for them to fill out. They would keep a copy. They would give two copies back to us. One copy would go through our material ordering department. One copy would go through the artwork and production department, and they would meet up right there right in staging before it got produced. And so, But, but if you think about it, that was technology, I mean that that's how you created a moat around Little League was those triplicate ordering forms. Yeah. You know, like Good it's point. no different now. It's just yeah. on robots and servers. Yeah. <laughs> and we can separate ourselves and, and you know, every look, the whole every year they bid it out, you know, and every year we would have somebody that would come in because they went and bought a six color manual from an, an ISS Fort Worth show and um, they'd come in, they'd bid on that because they'd have no idea. What it, what it would what it take you know they were just looking at oh I can buy a shirt for this and I can print it for that um, and they'd have no idea so we'd lose that we'd lose that one league for a year and then it'd be an absolute disaster and then they'd come back to us and you know and, and we built a really good business with that you know what's interesting I was just listening to it's like it's called Foundry it's a Bloomberg podcast uh, and it's doing a like a six part series on on Amazon and Bezos. And he was saying the way that he combated, you know, they came out with two day shipping and then Walmart and Best Buy came out with two day shipping, yeah. but they gave away prime video for free such that when people started going to Best Buy and Walmart, they'd be like, well, I still get prime video, so I might as well keep Amazon. Absolutely. It's kind of the same, same exact thing as like, yeah, you can go somewhere else, but what about the triplicates that are so nice and easy to order? Right. Like I think there's a lot of emphasis there that the shops take for granted is like how you how you are the solution for the shop is why people keep coming back over and over and over again. That's so, true, I don't know. true for anybody, you know, especially I think, you know, most most of the folks that are going to be watching this podcast, you know, they're going to be, you know, in, in, in the small business categories. And to Bruce's point, you know, obviously the goal of these podcasts is to entertain, but it's also to inform You know, Bruce's question about, you know, how do you how do you get a sticky customer? Uh, obviously relationships, you know, at the end of the day, um, because no, we're always going to screw up, you know, and it's having that relationship where, you know, you have customers that will work through. Price is, price is going to be the ultimate loser. We hear it and everybody talks about it and everybody has to learn that lesson the hard way. It, it just, I had to learn it the hard way. Um, but, you know, we see, we see all too often, especially on Facebooks or forums or whatever, 
you know, people to post, you know, hey, what what should I what should I charge? You know, or you know, or what is that? And you know, you'll get half the respondents that are somewhat respectful, and then you'll get, you know, always the twenty percent of the posts on there. They're just you know some guys trying to be you know keyboard courage and you know <laughs> keyboard um, courage. You know, and so. The, the, the pricing, everybody's pricing is different. And what I say is when, you know, especially when people come in there and somebody's, you know, you see these ads or somebody printing, you know, 100 white T-shirts for 395 and you get these just long diatribes about how stupid they are. And, you know, we had no idea what their overheads are. And we had no idea what their lifestyle is. You know, I mean, m- my lifestyle, the life that I want to live with my family, the cars I want to drive and the home I want to live in is X. And it requires this much cash to support that lifestyle. So who is it for me to judge that everybody else needs to have that same lifestyle? So if the guy can make 100 shirts for 395 and live the life he wants to live, good for him. You know, who are we to judge that 395 is it's it's too cheap cheap for me. I'm not going to print for 395. But, you know, either that guy will go out of business or, you know, he'll pay the bills. Um so I think a lot of times people are really judgmental on other people's costs when at the end of the day they just need to focus on their own business. I want to um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into Facebook because you actually provide a lot of value. Oh man! Probably the top five people that just actually help and you know take the time to write out some. Bruce, are you saying no one else helps? Well, I think people help, but like Jeff, like really has got these long like essays of of like you know very experiential stuff and the history that you pull from, but. I want to actually talk quickly though about uh, young one. Sure. Am I saying that right? It is. Yeah. So okay. uh, yeah, young one. Young one. So yeah. Over. So like, what what is young one? It sounds like a huge shop. What do they do? Who do they print for? And then, like, what you're doing there. And then we'll, you know, we'll get more into that too. And what yeah, you're learning. No, no, sure. I think I think that's you know probably why a little more I'm here is to, is I know that when I had a business here in the states, I. What was going on overseas? What was going on at the, the level of these huge factories was kind of foreign to me. So I thought, you know, it'd be cool to share that. So I, I, absolutely, I'm happy to do it. So, so Young One Corporation is uh, headquartered in Seoul, Korea. Okay, and um, we've been around since 1977, 82, somewhere in there. Uh-huh. Um, real top line numbers: about three billion dollars a year in revenue. Um, we employ uh, about eighty five. That was billion. Billion with a B. Yeah. Okay. For and apparel, so, um, it is. It's 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 all apparel. Now, I mean, I'm not, I'm not privy <laughs> like to all. I'm not privy to all the inner working drive. I mean, I, I I I'm not the accounting guy, right? I'm not going through our P and L and you know. You're just a screen reclaimer. Or? I, just, I just I just I just man, that would be a great job, right? It, um, you know, if you can make you know, I don't mind doing that job. If you want to pay me to do it, right? I mean, just keep my head down and no pressure. Um, but so so young one, you know, about three billion dollars a year in revenue, and um, it it is apparel. Now we have we employ about eighty five thousand people, eighty five thousand people worldwide, um, and our factories are in El Salvador, um, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Uzbekistan, Ethiopia, and we still have a, a really a, a small footprint in China. But um, our, our chairman saw the need to diversify that supply chain years ago. So we got ahead of that. Um, and primarily we're in, we're in Bangladesh. Um, if people are watching this um, on their computer, they can go to YouTube. If you just do a YouTube search of Young One Bangladesh, you'll see just countless videos, whether it be our own videos, whether it be from local news stations. Um, and it is primarily apparel. We do manufacture shoes. Um, so we do have some shoe factories, but the amount of screen printing, believe it or not, that goes into a shoe, many times is extensive. I mean, expect you know, not not that these are any. If I'm referencing brands, that might or might not be that we do business with those brands, right? For whatever it's worth, um, you know, we can't really talk about those specific people that we produce for. If you go to our wiki page or go to read some news articles, you'll see people talking about specific brands, but you know, there. Ninety-five percent of your closet is stuff we made. Bottom mm. line, you know, if, if you if you go into a gym or an athletic wear, one hundred percent of the product you're wearing in a gym, we are part of that supply chain at, at some at some point. Um, but just shoes, just shoes, um, like a Vans shoes. I mean, you know, you've got you've got the the, the left and right, you got the insole. All those are getting got a screen print on it, and then there's two pair. 
right? So you can have one pair of shoes that's going to have six locations. And I, the way we would talk about it, there's six locations, right, of screen printing. Um, and it might be silicone, it might be water-based, it, it might be some hybrid version of that. So we do do shoes. We also do backpacks, right? So um, embroidery is the primary uh, technique on backpacks. And then outerwear. So Bruce, to answer your question, um, our chairman, we, we made our mark um, in the early 90s and early 2000s and became the preeminent global leader in outerwear manufacturing. So whether it's, um, um, this isn't really, but um, DWR type stuff, whether it's you know, water repellent jackets, stuff you might climb in Mount, on Mount Everest. I mean, we've got you know, $1,500 you know, $1, cold weather heated stuff. Um, all the and way this down. is everything, I'm assuming, very verticalized from fabric to cut and sew to the screen printing and the, and the finishing. We do have our own mills. Now, what's unique, um, uh, and I'll try and share as much as, much as I can here, um, you know, the, the buyers that we work with. So when I, when, I say, when I use the word buyers, that also means brands, right? We refer to those as our buyers. So, um, you know, the buyers that we work with, a lot of time they'll, they'll have what's called a nominated mill. Right, they'll have one mill that they source their fabric through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fabrics a lot of times, is, fabric a lot of times is the secret sauce, um, and so they'll source that that fabric from that one mill, and but then they'll need four or five different suppliers to to do the cut and sew, because the program could be, <clears throat> your program could be you know twenty million units or fifteen million units, um, and you you might divide that up over five different factories but it's all coming from the same mill. How, how is something like that managed? I, I, you know, just the time is so long. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, can break that out into like six, like is it, <laughs> is it a super long time? For example, on this order, right? Is it six months or is it, uh, you know, you have so much capacity, it's one month. I, I don't even know. That's another, you know, I've worked for Young One now for about, about three and a half years. And one of the things that was most surprising to me is how quickly we're required to do things, right? I, you know, we always hear about stuff overseas. It takes three months or four months or five months. I, I wish we had. I wish we had that much time. So, um, you know, get, getting especially if we're if if the fabric's not coming from our mill, like if we if we are the mill and the cut and sew and the embellisher, we can control that supply chain a little more. But if the mill's in China and you know, really only our relationship is just kind of a, a handoff relationship from, between the buyer. And the mill, the buyer says, "Here, here's the mill you have to buy this from. Here's your price. Go buy it." We don't have much control. We're kind of at their mercy. And so, if that mill's late with that fabric, you know, there's a whole lot of this, right? I mean, the, the mill's going to blame the, the the shipping carrier, or the mill's going to blame somebody else, or but by the time the fabric gets to us, the, the ship date's still the same, right? And so, who's the buyer going to argue with? You know, it, so. A lot of times we'll have, I'm not kidding when I say, you know, it's a Monday and we're trying to get a container cleared out of customs. It's got rolls of fabric on it that we need to start cutting on Thursday because this, because the lines are scheduled to start sewing that on Saturday. And you think about the supply chain, you think, oh, how the hell, you know, you got what well, we always think of this really long supply chain. It's not any different than ordering from Staten on a Tuesday on a two day ship from UPS and you're waiting at the door for the guy to drop the boxes off because you got to start printing by one because UPS does pick up at 530. I mean, it's just the scale of it's just different. Um, but the, the problems are still the same. And Bruce, we manage it through it. We manage it through, um, you know, any of the global, you know, ERP, Oracle's SAP. We use that, that way. Um, oh my God. ERPs. I, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is your role in all of this? You know, I, I'm responsible for really global printing. You could call it embellishment because I, I guess sublimation and stuff kind of sometimes rolls up through me. But, but ultimately, mm -hmm. ultimately, if it gets a screen print on it at one of our factories, um, you know, I guess technically I'm responsible for that. Now, you know, primarily my focus right now is in Bangladesh because that's where a lot of our expansion is going on, building new factories. Um, we currently have... In Bangladesh, we have we have seven print facilities in Bangladesh, right? And and each print facility, just for scale, is you know 
if, if we call one auto, if, if people know that in their heads, you yeah. know, how big is a print facility? Yeah, so um, the, the one we just built um, in KPZ, uh, which is, stands for Korean Export Zone, that one now, we just ordered seven more machines, so that would put that at, you know, 20, you know, 20 to 20 to 24 autos, in each factory, right? We've got six of those factories. So, like, imagine running seven liquid graphics for people that have seen the liquid graphics tour. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a few of those shops in the U.S., right? I mean, um, liquid graphics, I mean, lake shirts, um, you know, I think that's Blue 84 now, it's the same thing, but there are a few of those still left in the States, not many. Um, but I will tell you, the, the, those shop, you know, 20 autos in the States is going to get out of a heck of a lot more than 20 autos anywhere else. Um, mainly, a lot of that's to do with Plastisol, right? You can just you can just churn out Plastisol inks at production levels far exceeding what you can um, in, in the water base. Interesting. Can you, can you discuss that a little bit? So outside of the U.S., Plastisol is is you know over there they're not using it as much or at all or is everything water-based tell us about that we don't use it at all the young one okay right you know one of our one of our kind of just core beliefs and a mission statement as you will uh from our chairman is you know you give me an idea the korean export zone this is about two thousand acres right that we've built this campus on that we employ thirty thousand people at this one location when he, when he worked with the Bangladeshi government to build this, he planted 2 million trees, right? And he built, you know, 400 acres of lakes. And so it's all about the environment. It's all, we have the largest rooftop solar complex in all of Bangladesh. And we power almost all of our needs through solar power. Um, you know, so all of our wastewater is treated 10 times over. Um, so we're a water-based factory. You know, we still have some inks that use some stuff that use solvent inks, right? When I mean, you're talking about some DWR type coatings that are just crazy water repellent, you're trying to put a water base fa- you're trying to put a water base ink on an, on a water repellent fabric. <laughs> it's a, it's a challenge, right? So, you know, one of the things I've I've learned, you know, last three years is, is I need I should have been a chemist, or, or, or <laughs> whether it you know whether it's polyurethanes or acrylics or all these things. We were fighting. You know, whether it's hydrophobic or, or, or whatever, we don't use Plastisol. There are some f- places maybe in Asia that, that still do, but most of the major brands, you know, so there's what's called an RSL, which is your restricted substance list. And there's what's called an MSRL, which is a manufacturer's restricted substance list. So we adhere to both. And so we have our own MRSL, which is a, our restricted substance list. So even if the buyer is coming in requesting something if it doesn't meet our standard we're gonna we're gonna develop it and sample it using our because it's going to exceed their their compliance requirements right you know some of the strictest out there you know levi's believe it or not not, not you know we might or might not do business with levi's but they have some of the most restrictive parts <laughs> allegedly um, levi's <laughs> allegedly so <laughs> so do you feel like the U.S. Is, obviously you're saying like U.S. is light years behind where the rest of the world is, um, or what it sounds like? Do you feel like if you were to look into a you know an, an eight ball and they'd say, hey, thirty years from now, this is how the U.S. will be? I think it'll take it'll take some legislation for that to really push that. Obviously, you know something like that would probably come out of California, right? When 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 they when they came out when they when they outlawed phthalates. Um, on children's wear, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's worth it. Phthalates are only illegal on children's wear, right? You know, if you wanted to print it on, 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 a, on a, but why are you going to have two different ink systems, right? Why are you going to have an ink system for kids and an ink system for adults? So all the ink manufacturers just started making a non-phthalate ink. The only reason they ever did that was because these RSLs and California regis- legislation. So it's probably, Stephen, it's probably going to take something like that to really to force it to force it because plastisol is just easy right i mean we started this conversation talking about bar- talking about barriers to entry plastis being able to print with plastisol ink lowers those barriers to entry significantly printing with water base is not easy it, it is just not and, and, and expect you know the idea especially in, in the licensed world in, in you know the custom ink world when you're when you're you know 
we can talk a little bit about, you know, my shop, our bread and butter was college athletics. I mean, we had, you know, 300 licenses back in the day. Um, but, you know, you got to hit that pantone, right? I mean, that, that collegiate licensing director, you know, when he's walking around, you know, his tailgating and he sees some shirt that walks by and he's like, that's not my Aggie Maroon. That's, you know, that's Garnett. You know, come on, does it really matter? Yeah, it does matter. It matters a whole lot. Well, being able to hit that color with Plastisol is not hard. Buy your mixing system, put in there. Being able to hit that color with water-based inks consistently is really difficult. Um, and, and I think that's why I give Eric and Val so much credit because if, if you don't, shop, yeah. if, I mean, I, when, when I talk to Eric and, and he talks about what they do, they literally build their inks like chemists yep. and they're hitting an insane color gamut on any garment. It's, I mean, it, it like we kind of gloat at it as like, holy cow, that's, that's, that's talent right there. And, and, yeah. you know, uh, Eric, if you're listening to this, don't let it get to your head, but, <laughs> um, that's, I mean, that's where the rest of the world is, you know? Yeah. So if I were to ask how much of the world is now moving now, like, can we bring the word digital into the equation? Like, sure, sure. Yeah. Hybrid transfers, digital squeegee, DTG. What do you see what's happening yeah. and what's coming? I guess. Especially yeah, well, a young one at, at a, such a large yeah, scale. Yeah, a young time. one. Yeah, I can, I'll, speak, I'll speak specifically. Um, so on the digital side of things, yes, it, it's coming. Um, the, the, especially the hybrid technology. Um, what we think of as DTG, it, it's, I don't see it being, it being a solution for us anytime soon. Mainly, you, you just got some wash fastness issues, you know, dye migrations, you know, I mean, you know, how am I going to stick a, a, a DTG on a, on a woven jacket, right? I mean, I can't, I can't add Nylabon to my digital ink, right? So, but if I can do a hybrid print, now you're kind of opening up um, the options here. So, you know, right now, you know, Young One, we, 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 we are not in that world. It's on our radar. Um, you know, we have a large development center um, in Bangladesh that, you know, that'd be the kind of something. We, we put a technology like that in there. And we would just keep it, you know, behind the curtain for a couple of years, you know, we, we and, and work on it and develop and sample and share with our buyers. We, we are not going to go out and show a new technology to a buyer that we can't execute. Um, it just, it doesn't help. Anybody. Have you bought into some of them yet? Um, young one has not. Young one has not. Um, you know, so. Why? Because it's driven by what just the customer is like, hey, look, we like it, this. Why? You know. And I would say, and I'd say, Bruce, my, my main I'm not convinced yet that the that any digital solution can meet the wash and color fastness requirements of our buyers. I'm just not. Mm. I'm not. Um, you know, you start putting top coats on there, then you get, is it going to be shiny? Is it going to be matte? Is it going to affect the hand feel? Um, and quite honestly, young one, we don't do a whole lot of full color stuff, right? We're, we're mostly outerwear, right? You're not walking around big full color photographs on the back of your, you know, windbreaker. You know, it's, it's logos here. It's, you know, we might, we might, one garment might have seven different print locations. Maybe there's reflective on the bottom right. There's a printed net sure. tag. Logo here. There's a logo here. There's three stripe here, three stripe here. But it's all one and two colors. Um, now, gotcha. we are driving more towards knits as, as, as a company. Um, you know, we've just built some new mills that are primarily, you know, you know, poly, you know polyester knits. So that's going to be more sportswear. And that's going to mean more graphic designs, right? You, you, you know, brands are adding value to their knits with graphics or logos. So, so then, Jeff, what about heat applied? So, like, okay, you know, digital, we kind of get that. What about just heat applied, uh, meaning printing on transfers, those kind of things? Is that we do a lot of transfers? It's in the tens and tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of transfers. Okay. Okay. Um, but they don't work for all of our solutions, right? Because there's still gonna be that heating element. Even if we have a heating element that's custom cut to the exact shape of the logo that's going down. I mean, we're doing custom dyed plates, right? Custom cut on, to I, like the check mark or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, it's, if it's going on a nylon jacket, what happens? It's gonna it's gonna leave a heat press. It's gonna leave a mark. Essentially, you're basically yeah. melting that nylon down, or you know, from I mean, over simplistic here, but 
Oh, and now you got a ring. Now you got that, that heating element ring. Kind of like what we see on a heat press on a t-shirt, right? You've got that square. Well, on a knit fabric, you can steam it or wash it out. If it's a nylon, it's there. I mean, you've literally changed the, the, the composition of the, um, of the fabric. So we do do a lot of it. We're actually, um, you know, looking, expanding, you know, bringing some of those capabilities um, in-house so that we can uh, manufacture um, our own transfers. Um, you know, the, the DTF world, um, I think for the states, I mean, I'm ex I would be really interested in what, DT in what DTF is doing. Um, I'm now, on machine number three. Are you? I mean. How's that one going? I'm not sure. I don't good. know. Either, either that says you're doing really good business or you're making some bad machine choices. I don't know which one that is. I'm an early adopter. I'm an early adopter. I will gamble a little bit. Um, and, you know, we will stress test it and run it. And uh, we, uh, we are on our third one. We think we like it, but I've said that twice before. Can you see which one this one is? Uh, this, is the, this is the this is the mongoose from DTF Superstore. Okay, um, it's a two-headed mongoose. I think it's built by Audley or Oric. I want to say um, it's really simple color gamut's good so far. We're just trying to dial in profiles, but I think like people are like, oh man, if you're on your third one. What the heck? Again, I go back to like you know you're in R and D all the time. You're always trying new things, always iterating. And then when you can take it to market, maybe you have something that's differentiating. For us, we're trying to DTF on jerseys. That's because we like the feel of transfers on jerseys and it allows us to do a print on demand for an entire, you know, collegiate basketball team. So like that's what I'm trying to solve. Yeah, are we going to be able to offshoot DTG and try other stuff? Yeah, but like it's serving a very specific niche. And I think, Jeff, to your point, you're always in in this experimentation phase. Like I feel like it never ends, ever. Um, I don't know. Kudos to you for getting ahead of it. I, I, I think that I think that I think that that technology has some legs. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's the best that's the best way I would describe it. Um, you know, we we might have, maybe maybe young when we get into that. Um, you know, eventually, um, you know, our, our focus is just right now is we've got to hit the volumes. I mean, our factories, you know, it, you know, it's, you know, it, it's not huge numbers daily, but it's very technical numbers. So, you know, 60 to 80,000 impressions or prints a day. Um, but printing, printing on very technical fabrics is a whole different ballgame than printing plastisol on cotton knits, um, you know, where, Whereas in the States, you know, we're, you know, oh my God, you see that guy running 800 an hour? And I'm kind of like, good, good for him. You know, let me see you do that for 10 hours a day and then we'll talk. But um, people like to brag, right? You know, that's fine. You know, my world, 200, 225, 175, 250, just slow and steady. We're all ovals, right? You know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Asian market, I guess another kind of history lesson here. You know, what we, it's called line printing or table printing or whatever. Mm -hmm. You see the videos where these long tables and the guy's going like this with the screen all the way down. Um, and we all look at that and go, Why let me tell you, you can do some awesome stuff on table printing. still really fast, you right? You can do some awesome stuff on table printing. But if that's what's required, you know, how do you automate table printing? You know, some of our stuff will have 12, 16, 20, 24 layers. And the reason for that is, is first of all, water-based ink. And second of all, the description I give a lot of times is, you know, if you're painting a wall at your house, you know, there's a couple of different ways you could do that. You know, I could go get a, I could go get a really thick, a little, really thick bristle brush with some white ink and I could dip that brush down in that paint and I could lacquer on a huge thick layer and I'm gonna cover that wall. I could, might even be able to do it in one coat, but it's, it's gonna be a little rough. You're gonna see the bristle marks, right? If you get up, look on there close. And you've only got one layer on there. Well, a high quality painter, the painter that's gonna come in and do it correctly, he's gonna prime, he's gonna sand it. He's gonna prime it. Then he's gonna take a really thin bristle brush and he's gonna paint a layer, he's gonna let it dry. He's gonna paint another layer, let it dry. He's gonna paint another layer, let it dry. And you know, if it's, he might paint four, five or six layers that way. Well now, he's got a really thin layer perfectly smooth and it's really really durable that's what we're doing when we're printing with our with our types of inks and what most people do on line tables is they're printing very thin layers 
multiple times and stacking that up and you're getting a really thin print, but it's super durable, right? You know, the, the testing requirements for the brands, whether it's, you know, there's a test called a crocking meter. It's a little thing that just kind of scrapes across the top of the, and that, that's for color fastness. Um, there's a test called a Tabor test, which actually grinds a wheel, a little stone wheel around it. And you're just trying to get that, to get that ink to pick up. All these brands have requirements for those. You've got to pass 10,000 cycles or you've got to pass X. It requires really technical printing. Um, I think my, my better half's about to walk through, but um, yeah, she's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, we here you know, we have a, our home office here. We've actually built these off these desks here. Hello. Hey. Hello. Oh wow, it looks nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we did this kind of right at the start of the pandemic, so we kind of looked out there. Uh, how often do you have to go to Bangladesh? Then I mean, you, you know, you must have to be there half the year, right? Uh, I'm. I, I traveled eight times last year. To, to, to Asia. And so each trip is anywhere from, you know, about three weeks each time. Um, wow. And, and I never stopped traveling during the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I joke that, you know. Yeah, you posted those photos, I remember, I think, right? You had the mask on, you were the only person on the plane. Yeah, I mean, there were some times where, you know, I would be on a, you know, triple seven, you know, and there were 11 of us on there, the entire plane. You know, you're not, you know, I mean, 11 people. Um, and you're like, well, why are they flying? Well, a lot of these airlines, they have to keep their slots, right? This antiquated system, if they don't use it, they lose it. And so they're flying almost half empty planes. But then what I learned, Bruce, is that they didn't really care if anybody flew on it or not because they were making so much money on the cargo. Right. The cargo mm. rates went so high. Right. I mean, there were, there were times that I was flying into Bangladesh where Emirates, they would fly passengers to Bangladesh but they would not fly any passengers out because the UAE would not allow even transiting from Bangladesh. So they would fly planes to Bangladesh and they would fly it back 100% empty because it was, the cargo was so valuable. She Ryan was the one that told me about that because he yeah. was like moving masks back and forth. How, so he, how was like traveling through the pandemic in the Asian countries, you're a U.S. citizen. What was that like? Like you're you're working for a company. I assume you all were making a ton of PPE, you know. But what was that like for you? Like like going into war zone all the time. Like what's that like? Bangladesh is is um it's just challenging. It's, it's challenging to get to. First of all, I mean, at the height of the pandemic, when flights were so few, I mean, some of my total travel time was forty to forty five hours. Right, I'd leave Seattle. In 45 actual hours, not time zone hours, 45 actual hours to finally get to my final destination. That's down to the low 30s now because there's just more flight options, right? I wouldn't have these huge long layovers. Before the pandemic, you could do it as low as 22, 24 hours. Um, but, you know, Bangladesh is, it's challenging. And just, you know, not only just getting there, but then just, um, you know, the, the, the people are great. But, man, it's, it's, it's still a third world developing country. Um, as far as you know, traveling through you know Dubai and Singapore and so these countries are great. Um, you know, I, I love Asia. I mean, they are efficient. The, the, the people are wonderful. You know, we're not going to get into whether we need to be wearing masks or not. But in my opinion, if that's the rule, then I'm going to wear the mask. Whatever, I'm going to wear the damn mask. In Asia, nobody even questions it. It's just everybody wears the mask. Everybody waits in line. Um, you know, but it was. I mean, it, it's still unique today you know, for, for Americans to be traveling into Bangladesh. And you do. I mean, you know, <laughs> I joke with my wife. I mean, you know, I'm only 5'9 here in the States, but over there I feel like I'm 6'2". <laughs> and there there are, it's part of like Guangzhou right now is shut down, right? Like there are, there are areas in China that are still it's, shut yeah, down. I, I mean, Shenzhen, um, you know, Shanghai. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, I think they're missing the boat over there, um, you know, but, you know, who am I to, you know, question the Chinese government, but it is, it, it, it is difficult. And, you know, there, there were times during the pandemic that, um, you know, I would, testing was the hardest part of that travel. Um, you know, because again, if I'm, if I'm taking, it's taking me 40 to 45 hours to get there and a country's got a 48 hour or 72 hour testing requirement, when did I get my test taken? And is, is the requirement on the time of the result or the time of when I took the test? 
well, each co different countries would have different rules. Is a test required in transit, or is a test required just to get a visa? Right. You know, right. So, so, so how many times did you get stuck? Oh, um, oh, hundreds. I mean, they're, they're, you know, when, when I would leave sometimes for, for, for a trip, I would, let's say my flight was on Wednesday, I would go get a test. I would get a test on mon on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And if my if my flight was the Wednesday afternoon or evening, I would get a test Wednesday morning. Just to so have. I, I would travel with four different tests, based in, in because the results would actually be coming in as I was traveling sometimes, right? And you know there were times where I'd have like a twelve hour layover, and I'd be checking my email, going, "Man, I better get that result," because the time of that result, because my, my previous one had expired based on where I was going through. Um, so that was challenging. Um, you know, back, 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 back to the digital stuff. Yeah. You see, I, I, do, I do commend you on, 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 what, on, on getting ahead of that. And, you know, I would encourage people, the DTF, the DTF has some legs, and it's only going to get better. I mean, I remember when DTG first started, kind of come full circle in this conversation. You know, Scott Fresner at U.S. Screen Printing, he, what we refer to as the T-Jet. You know, there's the T-Jet 1, the T-Jet 2, and the T-Jet, he might have made a 3, I don't know. And that was early 2000s. And really, they were just taking Epson machines and, you know, kind of, you know, DIYing them and pushing some ink through it. But they worked. But you had to be really handy to get them to work. And that's where DTA, the DTF is right now. It's not plug and play. You know, brother, you know, the, we have dedicated DTG machines now. And they're pretty much plug and play. They work. DTF is where DTG was 15 to 20 years ago. As you know, Stephen, if you get one of these machines, you've got to be technical. You, not only do you got totally. to, you know, not only you got to know how to build profiles, you got to know how to, to maintain heads. You might even have to know how to change out a head. You got yep. to work with rollers and and all these different things. And so, if 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 you're listening to this and you are handy, you know, if you're the kind of guy that was going to change the alternator on the Chevy small block you can probably figure out how to work a DTF. Does it does yeah. it outpace DTG, you think? It will, um, it will, yeah. it, it will eventually. Once yeah, because some of, the, some of the major Once some of the major manufacturers begin building dedicated machines, um, I, I think it will. I mean, Stephen would know, which could certainly speak to it better than I can. Stephen, what do you think? I mean, I think, I think you know, the transfer in general, I asked you that question, is there more heat applied transfers? There's a transition now, I think, from screen printing to more heat applied transfer apparel now. Whether the transfer is screen printed or digitally printed, that's that's another day. But there's definitely a big wave into into heat applied transfers. I think the 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 benefits of, you know, DTF are no pretreat, um, because pretreat is still a unsolved mystery that no one has really perfected. Um, and from a durability standpoint, we're seeing that a transfer is holding up pretty well. I mean, we see what Supercolor is doing in rum and stuff like that. And, you know, if you don't have to press a shirt, if you don't have to spray a shirt, press a shirt, um, you know, print a shirt and then press it again, and you can take out a couple of the steps, it is, it is going to be faster. Um, can they figure out, you know, how to make it user friendly and stuff? That's, that's the next question because you are using water-based inks through, you know, a, a digital print head and things clog and corrode and, and all that stuff. So there's still a lot of unsolved and, you know, quite frankly, the powder is still a slight mystery a little bit. How do you feel about like powder? Um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So if, if people listen to this, you know, there, there's two different... We can make transfers, right? Whether they're whether they're hybrid, you know, whether it's kind of like an whether it's like a you know an indigo slash eno combination, which is um, really high end. It's not technically DTF, but it's more similar to DTF. Or whether it's a screen printed transfer, we've still got to figure out a way to get that on and stuck to, for lack of a better word, we got to get it to stick to whatever we want it to stick to. Um, and we need an adhesive. And there's there's liquid adhesives and there's powder adhesives. And then there's different versions of each of those, right? I mean, you could have four or five different kinds of powder adhesive based on the need. You know, is it, is, it, is it fine? Is it coarse? Does it need to stick to a DWR fabric? Is it sticking to a polyester fabric? Does it need to stretch? Then you have all those same things with liquid, liquid adhesives. Um, you, whenever you see a transfer and you see that slight halo, 
around it, right? Sometimes I see people post, oh, how do I get that clear outline? Well, that clear outline is actually not intentional. <laughs> it's just a byproduct um, of printing down a clear adhesive. And if it's if it's liquid adhesive, we have to do an we have to do an overprint, right? Right. So we have to, you know, we have to choke the actual transfer and then overprint. Remember, transfers print in reverse because at the end we turn it over like this. So we what goes on the bottom of the transfer is actually what you end up seeing, and then there's layers above that. Maybe there's a dye blocker. The final layer is the adhesive, and that adhesive is either going to be powder or it's going to be liquid. If it's liquid, you're going to see a slight halo. If it's powder, you don't. Well, Jeffrey, why would you just not always use powder? Fair question. If the detail is so small, think neck labels, right? If the detail, if the detail is so small and there's font sizes that are so tiny, there's not enough for that. There's not enough for the powder to stick to, right? Because the powders, it's a powder. It's got, it's granular, right? There's, lack of a better word, there's small grains in there. And so to, to really get those very small details to stick, we have to print a liquid adhesive. Um, you know, I, I, I prefer powder adhesive because, you know, if you're doing this all in line, if you got the right setup, powder adhesive reduces another layer, you're reducing a, a step. Um, and I would use powder adhesive on everything I could um, if if the detail didn't get so small that um, I had to use liquid. Yeah, I think that's what I ran through. So on the first DTF I got, it tried to digitally print liquid adhesive. And it worked for the first month. Yeah. But then the second month and the third month, the liquid started, it just, it, it ruined the print head. And then it, it started to fail. And so, yeah, the first two weeks on with it were awesome. And then over time, the print had started to fail. And what we noticed was we didn't know if the liquid adhesive was actually printing half the time. So we would print out 100 feet of transfers. And, you know, liquid adhesive, you can see a little haze to it. Like, you can see it. Mm -hmm. But if it was firing at 75% or 60% and it wasn't getting a full nozzle test, we wouldn't know until we pressed it. And so sometimes we would press it and then we try to pull and it would, it would completely mess up. Sometimes it would come up. We would think we had a good match. We'd ship it out to the customer one wash and it was done. Mm -hmm. So I gave, I said, this, this technology is not where it needs to be because there's no way to securely know that you are seeing that liquid adhesive. And then, you know, you look at some other companies that actually screen print liquid adhesive and that's to make sure you get a full, but then like you said, you can see the halo and it's like, it's a reverse choke or whatever trapped. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely like that is an evolving technology. And I think if you look at like a fanatic shirt and you look at the neck label, you'll see that they've printed that liquid adhesive and it's much bigger than the print, right? Like a lot of neck labels have it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um. You know, it, the bigger the bigger you, the bigger you can make that choke, the 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 easier it is to print it, right? And yeah, that's just a balance between you know what your buyer and your brand is going to allow you to do. You know, Fanatics has has done a great job of of really controlling their licenses. You know, they're kind of they are they are the buyer, right? And so, um, you know, whatever their tolerances are is their own tolerance. And so, you know, I, I always kind of look at it and go. But the sportswear market's a different market, right? I mean, if if you're walking in and you're buying a Lululemon, um, you know, ladies buying a hundred fifty dollar Lululemon workout shirt, there's a, it's reasonable to have a different expectation of all the trims and embellishments than you would when you're going online and you're buying your, you know, your your Packers game day jersey. It, it's it's just different. Um, and it doesn't mean either one of them is right or wrong. It's um, it's um, it's just different expectations. Um, but, but certainly, D DTF. I mean, if I was in the states right now, um, you know, I, I say this not tongue in cheek. Uh, what's the right? Maybe grain of salt, right? Um, you know, some of the big, some of the things that, some of the mistakes that I made. I mean, boy, I made a lot of them. But you know, back in I started when I was thirteen. Parents, small shop. I started learning how to print on a brown six color manual. Had an old oval clamshell press. That was all through the 90s. Went to college, swore I never wanted to be in the screen printing business. That's terrible. That's mom and dad's business. I hate it. Never want to do that. 
went out in the real world for a couple of years and realized the real world is not what college told me it was going to be like. It sucks. Why do I want to work in the corporate America? I called my mom 2002. Um, mom, have you ever thought about me coming back and working in the business? Of course, you know, prodigal son returns. Um, went to my first trade show in 2002, which was ISS Long Beach. Walked that floor and I was just like, because all I knew was a six color brown manual and, and, and a precision oval. And I was just, we were just printing for local high schools. But then I went there and I saw M&R with, even back then, inline flocks and foils and Tajima and embroidery machines. And I was hooked. And, you know, for the next 10 years, I worked in the family business. And um, we grew that, ended up being nine autos, about 60,000 square feet, um, mainly in college, you know, college um, licenses, right? Fraternity sorority business and then college athletics. Um Built a good business, and we exited that business um, in, in 2010. But all through that business, man, if, if, I had, if I could talk to, have a time capsule and go back and talk to my younger self, you know, kind of just some basic business principles that maybe if I can impart, you know, obviously the, the side of the business that I'm working on now is at just massive levels. But, you know, I learned it, you know, whoever's listening to this podcast, yeah, what, what would you say? It's funny because this is what I wanted to ask because this is some of the advice you put right here. I know Ferry's got a meeting in a couple of minutes, but like, what yeah, would you sure. say are a couple of um, things that you This do? is the advice I need because I'm in the college market, fraternity market. <laughs> and uh, well, you, you already said a couple of things, Jeff, that I, I honestly think we need to do like a part two of this because we have I've to got do some other two. stuff. So we'll, we'll schedule it separately. But like, for today, what are, what are some of those things that you, you'd yeah. give? Well, that's for sure. Let's 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 absolutely schedule a part two, please. I mean, I, I would love. It's to happening. This, is, this has been um, this has been great. I think you know we've, we've got a good flow here. So, um, but the main mistakes that I made, um, and I would hope that you know people listen to is, first of all, I tried to be everything to everybody. You know, I, we were good at printing T-shirts for the local. You know, we'll stay on the little league bandwagon. I was good at printing, but then that, then, that, then that same uniform mom would come in and they would need some signs and banners for the outfield sponsors. Mm. Well, I didn't want to send her down to the local sign and banner guy because I also knew that he did t-shirts, right? And so I brought signs and banners in-house and I figured out how to do that and I wasn't very good at it. And so we'd spend hours trying to figure out how to grommet the edges of a banner when what we needed to be doing was spending those hours making, making t-shirts. Or, you know, we suddenly got into vehicle wraps because one of my largest customers, which it was, it was a college, and they wanted to wrap some of their vehicles that they used to do campus tours around. Well, there was another place in town that, that specialized in vehicle wraps, but I didn't want to send them down there. Just I don't know why I did because I wanted to control the process. So I tried to be everything to everybody, and I really wasn't very good at anything. Right. And so focusing on what you're good at and then finding key suppliers that you trust and can execute the things that you're not good at. That's running a business. You know, doing everything yourself is not running a business. You're just, you know, you're just doing that's a that's a hobby that's paying the bills at that point. So, you know, and the other thing is. Find whether it's whether it's ASI type suppliers or whether it's, you know, out, you know, third party embroiderers, you know, what I, we would bring these things in house because of our own inefficiencies. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we had a great, you know, awards guy or great pin supplier or great mug supplier, but they would have do, they would have deadlines, right? If I didn't send that PO and artwork in on by Monday, they weren't going to get it to me by Friday. Well, so what would happen? Well, I didn't get, because I didn't have my ducks in a row, I'd try to send that order in on Tuesday, and then I would disappoint my customer because they didn't get it in time. So what was my solution? It wasn't to figure out a better process of submitting my orders. It was, well, I'll just bring that in-house and do it myself. Right? Because then it, get to, it got to cover up my own inefficiencies. Right? Because if I didn't get that artwork out in time, you know, I could just ask my people to stay late and print those mugs themselves. Well, we went down the same road on so many different things. Um, that, that was probably our, our, our main mistake. And we can talk about all the other mistakes I've made in, in part two. Steven, That's I know, awesome. I know you've got to go, but, you know, figure out what you're good at. And then if you want to be a businessman, 
you build out a supply chain for people that can support the things you aren't good at. That, that's that's the awesome. one thing I can impart on people. And that's part one. That's part one. We, uh, we will we will run this back because this is this is awesome. I think listeners are gonna love this. This is probably one of my favorite episodes so far. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll thank you so so much. Yep. Yeah, we, I, uh, I, I want to hear more about what you guys are doing and, and you know, kind of maybe peek behind the curtain. Uh, um, you know, I, it'd be great. So part two, we'll 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 cover a lot of other topics. Yeah. I, I have an investor meeting in like ten minutes, All right. So. So, I guess tell, tell Mark hi. I don't know. I mean, is that I uh he just shot me a message this morning, so we'll uh we'll see. Uh I got a text that said there were a lot of exclamation points, so I think that's a so good thing. Don't miss the meeting. We'll talk to y'all soon.